All right, here's the deal. Um, some of you are discussing Anselm, or will be shortly. And at the beginning of his argument, he, he situates it in such a way as to try to explain why Christ needed to die and rise again so as to repopulate the heavenly city. So the idea is, way back in the beginning of all things, God created a whole bunch of angels. Some of those fell. Um, you heard about that, the fall. But when they fell, um, the heavenly city was left somewhat vacant. And hey, we need more tenants. So let's save some people and they can refill the heavenly city. The purpose of this paper is to provide the context for that, not by placing Anselm in his immediate context back in the day in Canterbury, but to locate him within a, the history of discussion about the role of angels within the atonement. Okay, Because you might be inclined to think he's odd or just flat out crazy by starting off his treatise on the atonement by thinking about the angels. And in fact, people have been doing that all throughout the history of the church in a wide variety of ways. So I'm locating you in his doctrinal context rather than historical context. <clears throat> that means I'm only going to be talking about Anselm a little bit, but I'll be talking about loads of figures that you read in here, and, uh, and then loads of theologians that it's too bad we don't get to read. But we don't all get to be theologians for a living, and that's too bad. <clears throat> all right. The church's reflection on angels did not cease with the writings of the angelic doctor, that's Thomas Aquinas, Though when it comes to striking the balance between the far too interesting mythology of the ancients and the far too uninteresting demythologization of most moderns, ours is the latter error. The heyday of sustained theological and philosophical inquiry into the hierarchy, ontology, epistemology, and fall of the angels has long passed in favor of the conviction as expressed by Adolf von Harnack. The kingdom of God is not a question of angels and devils, thrones and principalities, but of God and the soul, the soul and his God. In other words, Pseudonionysis is long gone, and now all we really care about is God and the soul and none of this angel stuff. <clears throat> Nevertheless, as we are to do theology in the context of the church, and in the light of the witness of scripture, we have the ongoing freedom and task to explore angelology and its place within the gospel of Jesus Christ. For as Charles Hodge notes, so much is said in the scriptures of good and evil angels, and such important functions are ascribed to them that the doctrine of the Bible concerning them should not be overlooked. Right? So back in the day, you had all this cool angelology stuff. We all nerded out on it. Then modern theology came along and said, angels, uh, that's a lot of mythology. We'll get rid of it. Charles Hodge comes back and says, no, um, there's an awful lot said in scripture. We have to think about it. So what we're going to do is think about angelology, specifically in regard to the atonement. The purpose of this essay is to draw attention to a particularly dusty corner of this theological shelf, the question of the inestimable benefits received by the unfallen angels from Christ's atoning death and resurrection. For if, as Pseudo-Dionysus suggests, this salvation redeems everything in accordance with the capacity of things to be saved, then surely we are right to explore the capacity in which the angels are saved by Christ. While certain questions regarding angels have received a great deal of attention, and the work of Christ has often been developed in light of Satan and the demons, the same cannot be said of what today amounts to a demilitarized zone between these two loci, the impact of Christ's atoning work on the, un on the unfallen angels. Right? So, lots of people write on atonement and demons, right? but why give demons all the, all the, all the attention? Let's, uh, let's let the angels have their share. <clears throat> so this essay consolidates organizes and contributes to the reflections of theologians throughout the history of the church on this topic, that we might understand and rejoice in the fact that all things in heaven were reconciled to God through the blood of Christ. That's an abbreviated form of Colossians 1, 2. Uh, specifically, I developed five different ways that the death and resurrection of Christ bore upon the unfallen angels, repopulating the heavenly city, and some, uh, revealing the character of God to the angels, thereby changing their worship, confirming the angels in their unfallen state, bringing order to the angelic realm through the headship of Christ, and justifying the ways of God to the angels. However, because one of the salutary effects of studying angelology is the balance and perspective it brings to other aspects of one's theology, I, I conclude each of these sections by reflecting on the benefits we receive from this study. Not because our own profit is of primary or sole importance, but because our fate is bound up with that of the angels. 
and the salvation they receive from Jesus Christ, though distinct from our own, nevertheless informs and contributes to our appreciation of the benefits we likewise receive from Christ. All right, one of the reasons the medievals liked studying angels is because it did two things. It allowed them to, to ask great big questions, but to do so from a different vantage point, there was um, <clears throat> different turf. Basically what studying angels did was allowed them to ask both anthropology questions and theology questions by covering the turf in between. Um, so that it gave a different perspective from approaching both questions. And, um, but in, in, in doing that, they ended up having benefits both anthropologically and theologically. So whenever we study the angels, that helps us better understand ourselves by looking at ourselves from an outside perspective by our creaturely cousins. <clears throat> All right, before proceeding, I will briefly consider um, the admittedly modest biblical warrant for this project. Otherwise, you'll just think I'm flat out crazy. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Hebrews 2.16 indicates that Christ came to help the offspring of Abraham, not the angels. So there are clearly ways in which the work of Christ differs in its effect upon the angels and the offspring of Abraham. And there are significant ways in which Christ's atonement did not bear upon the former. All right, so yes, there are ways the angels are, that were affected by Christ, but the angels aren't. Fair enough. But salvation, like the sin that it saves us from, is a complex reality. Humans need salvation from their sin, its effects, and salvation in the sense of fruition and fulfillment of creaturely being. Right? When, when you're saved, you're saved from your sin, you're saved from the effects of your sin, and you're saved into the fullness of human existence. While the angels do not need salvation in this full sense because they didn't sin, we may nonetheless consider how they might need salvation in the latter two senses mentioned above. Salvation from the effects of sin, and salvation as fulfillment of their creaturely identity and vocation. So while Hebrews rules out the first sense, it leaves the latter two open to consideration. While scripture does not develop these matters at length, it does open certain possibilities for our consideration. For instance, there are things of which the angels are ignorant in uh, Matthew 24, and more suggestively, the angels are said to long to understand things pertaining to the suffering of Christ in 1 Peter. And while one of their primary purposes is to ascribe glory to the name of the Lord, that's Psalm 29, Upon his ascension, Christ was given a new name, a name above every name, a change of some import for those whose occupation is to glorify the one newly renamed. Of great interest is the New Testament witness that the work of Christ is proclaimed throughout the heavens and to the rulers and authorities therein, Ephesians 3.10. So the gospel has this being proclaimed to the heavens and the powers and the principalities. What is going on there? <clears throat> While this might refer to rulers and authorities opposed to Christ, other passages make clear that the work of Christ was a matter of reconciling all things to Christ, which of course would include the angels just as well as the demons. And most provocatively of all, Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says that in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So what does this mean? How might Christ, to abbreviate the above passage, reconcile to himself all things in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross? <clears throat> Admittedly, this is a relatively thin strand upon which to wait, hang um, weighty doctrinal reflection. And though our primary focus should be on those biblical and theological topics which are most central and offer the most theological material for rigorous development, we nevertheless have the freedom and the challenge to explore more remote corners of the biblical terrain. Um, so while the reflections below do not have the same epistemic justification as other aspects of Christ's atonement, Scripture nevertheless gives us warrant to modest yet creative explorations in this area, the project to which we now turn. Basically, there are things that are really, really firmly established in the Gospel. That's where we start. And then there are these random corners of Scripture we're like, what is going on there? Like the Nephilim that come down and have children with the daughters of men. You're like, what is going on there? <laughs> right? We can focus on the central stuff, great. But that, that focus should always enable us to poke around in those less well-attested areas, be creative and see what we come, come, come up with, knowing that it doesn't have the same warrant as those more central things. But hey, let's be creative. We have the opportunity and the vocation, so let's do it. All right. The most popular view regarding the impact of the atonement on the angels is that of Christ's work repopulating the heavenly city. Origen, 
Origen wrote before there was such a thing as orthodoxy. So he's kind of the father of all the bad stuff and all the good stuff. He was just immensely creative. Everyone likes appropriating him. All right, so Origen influentially argued that God predetermined a definite number of rat rational creatures, which would be sufficient for his creative purposes. This is a quote. We are to suppose that God created so great a number of rational or intellectual creatures as he foresaw would be sufficient. It is certain that he made them according to some definite number, predetermined by himself, for it is not to be imagined, as some would have it, that creatures have not a limit, because where there is no limit, there can neither be any comprehension nor any limitation. Moreover, as scripture says in the Book of Wisdom, God has arranged all things in number and measure. Right? Fair enough. If God made something, he probably knew how many of it he made, and he had a reason for it. <clears throat> Drawing on this idea, Augustine writes, another guy you're familiar with, since it was not the whole company of angels that had perished by deserting God, those who had perished should remain in perpetual perdition, while those who had persevered with God should have the joy of knowing that their future happiness was assured. As for humanity, since they had totally perished by reason of their sins and punishments, some of them were to be restored to fill the gap left in the company of the angels by the devil's fall. Right. This is the same fundamental framework employed by Anselm, who integrated this view with the question of God's honor. So what's innovative about Anselm is the honor stuff, not the angel's bit. That's really old and everyone agreed with him. The fundamental goal of Christ, as Anselm saw it, was to restore the honor of God by providing satisfaction in such a way as would ultimately restore the ranks of the heavenly city by means of redeemed humankind. As Bernard of Clairvaux put it, if we take the, f the wall in the Song of Songs, um, chapter 2, to be in not an assembly of stones, but the communion of saints. Perhaps the crannies of the wall can be seen as the gaps left by the angels when they fell, and which are to be filled by men, like ruins to be mended by living stones. Three points are essential to this position. First, God created a specific number of rational beings or angels to populate the heavenly city. Right? Set number. <clears throat> Second, a fall of the angels precedes the fall of humankind, accounting for such things as the presence of the serpent in Eden emptying the heavenly city of a certain definite number of members, and third, those of the human race that are saved, refill the ranks left vacant by the fallen angels, restoring God's creation to its intended perfection. But how is this view relevant to the angels who remained in heaven when its significance for humankind is so manifestly evident, right? It's clearly a bonus for us. Hey, we get to repopulate heaven. There are vacancies in these sweet spots. We get them, right? How does it matter for the angels? <clears throat> The answer has to do with the way Christ's saving work extends the unity and fellowship proper to the triune God into the creaturely realm. Right. Augustine writes, Christ did not die for the angels, but the redemption and liberation from evil of any human by, by his death, Christ's death, benefits the angels since such a person in a, since such a, person in a sense returns into good relations with them after the enmity caused between men and the holy angels by sin. And by the redemption of men, the losses caused by the fall of the angels are made good. The important thing is that we're restored into good relations with the, with the angels. <clears throat> Athanasius, writing more poetically of the nature of these good relations, anticipates the heavenly feast we will celebrate with our angelic brethren. brethren. In similar fashion, John Owen writes that even the things in heaven so far stood in need of reconciliation as that they might be gathered together in one with the things on earth the glory whereof is manifested in this heavenly ministration. Right? So the idea is what God wanted to do in creating and therefore in, re in, in atoning was to restore us to unity with himself that we might partake of the unity proper to himself with each other. So how does the atonement benefit the angels? When we're restored in the heavenly city and the heavenly city is filled back up, they now have the full share of unity and fellowship proper to the life of God meant for creatures. So that's a benefit to them. <clears throat> to these reflections, we add the point that the triune God lives a life of unity and oneness. And we, in our sin, mock that unity by living fragmented lives, which at every level reek of civil war, opposition, and strife. Christ, in bearing our sin, bears this strife and its consequences, restoring unity and fellowship at every level of creation, including the heavens. It is thus fully appropriate to rejoice that through Christ the angels come to enjoy the fruit of his reconciling work, unity and fellowship with their human brethren, as together we worship the triune creator and reconciler of all things. 
Though the angels were not saved from their own sin, strife, and conflict, they were saved in the sense of enjoying the benefits of salvation, which they previously enjoyed incompletely. The benefit of the unity and fellowship proper to the triune God extended into the creaturely realm. Dwelling on this aspect of Christ's work greatly emphasizes the multidimensional reconciliation that was the purpose of Christ's work, ranging from our reconciliation to God as individuals to societal and cosmic levels. Right. <clears throat> so that's the way they're saved, even though not from their sin. Now they can enjoy the full of God's blessings, the fullness of God's blessings. All right, second point. Um, worship and its basis, atonement as revelatory. The work of Christ affected the angels in more ways than repopulating the heavenly city, for it changed their song. No small matter for a being whose primary end is to worship. The work of Christ revealed the character of God to the angels in an unprecedented manner. In this revelation manifested itself in a corresponding change in development in the worship of the angels. In this section, we focus first on the revelatory nature of the work of Christ and then turn our attention to the subsequent effects of that revelation upon angelic worship. <clears throat> so John Owen writes that Christ and he alone declares, represents, and makes known unto the angels and men the essential glory of the invisible God, his attributes, and his will, without which a perpetual comparative darkness would have been on the whole creation. Angels who knew and praised the holiness of God prior to the incarnation, we see that in Isaiah and lots of places, thus would have lacked a significant benefit had God not become man. As Jonathan Edwards argues in his miscellanies, <clears throat> basically um, Jonathan Edwards wrote Pascal's Pensees, but it was like volumes long. All these collections of thoughts, snippets, half essays, anyway, so that's his miscellanies. Think of it as the, as the Pensees. Uh, so as Jonathan Edwards argues, the perfections of God are manifest to all creatures, both men and angels, by the fruits of those perfections, or God's works. So the glorious angels have the greatest manifestations of the glory of God by what they see in the death of Jesus and suffering of Jesus Christ. While preaching on 1 Timothy, he notes that perhaps all God's attributes are most gloriously manifest in this work than in any other that the angels ever saw. How full of joy does it fill the hearts of angels to see such a boundless and bottomless ocean of love and grace in their God. Reinforcing this point, he writes that what they, uh, what they beheld of the glory of God in the face of Christ as man's redeemer, and especially in Christ's humiliation, greatly increased their holiness and their obedience. And that's really cool, because the medievals thought primarily in terms of the angels just knowing everything because they contemplate God. Edwards and others are locating their knowledge primarily in what they see of God acting, which means you have this crowd of angels waiting to actually see what happens as God reveals his character. And as he does so, their knowledge of God is changing at the same time as ours is changing. So revelation through Christ is impacting them just as much as it's impacting us, although it's in an angelic way rather than a human way. <clears throat> right. Such knowledge, um, such growth in knowledge, unfettered by sin, immediately resulting in spiritual growth, naturally becomes worship. At the sight of Christ, the angels are filled with the admirations of God, ascribing praise, honor, and glory unto him forevermore. For the beholding of the mystery of the wisdom of God in Christ is the principal part of the blessedness of the angels in heaven, which fills them with eternal delight and is the ground of their ascribing praise and glory unto him forevermore. This idea of the changing worship of the angels is of ancient pedigree. <clears throat> In the ascension of Isaiah, this really, really old um, Hebrew text, as Jesus Christ ascends to the levels of the heavens upon the completion of his earthly work, the angels in these levels praise him, and in all the heavens the praise grows louder and louder and louder as he goes up through and the angels see and recognize who he is and what he's done. Prior to the work of Christ, the angels praise God because he's the creator. But upon the death of Christ, Coleridge, another guy you're familiar with, tells us of how he heaven's hymnings paused and hell her yawning mouth closed a brief moment. Hilary of Potier tells us of how upon his resurrection the angelic host praised him because he conquered death, broke the gates of hell, won for himself a people to be his fellow heirs, and lifted flesh from corruption up to the glory of eternity. This change in the angelic worship, this new song, is the emphasis of Edward's claim that this act of his is celebrated by the angels and hosts of heaven with peculiar praises as that which is above all others glorious 
as you may see in the context of Revelation 5. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by that blood. <clears throat> Briefly, this builds up the church in its ongoing effort to understand and fittingly integrate the work of Christ and the spiritual formation of believers ending in worship. <clears throat> as Calvin says, there is not a better nor a more desirable exercise than to praise God. And since there is not a more excellent service in which even the angels are employed, a church captivated by the saving work of the triune God will be hungry to have this knowledge, yield its fruit in the transformation of character, which enables us to join the angels in worshiping God, allowing the saving work of Christ to color and shape its worship. As, as Leo the Great puts it, how much more should the lowliness of human beings rejoice over this indescribable work of divine pity when the sublimity of angels so delights in it? Why did God become man? That he might reveal himself to us, equipping and freeing us to worship the same way he equipped and freed the angels to worship. <clears throat> Third point, <clears throat> the confirmation of the angels. But if the angels can change, if they can grow in understanding and make new songs, are there limits to the extent to which they can change? Can they fall? The church typically asks this question under the category of the confirmation of the angels. <clears throat> the point at which the choice of the angels to love and worship God is ratified so as to be irreversible. Right? Everyone wants to know when, when angels and when we are confirmed. When can we not mess things up anymore? Right? <clears throat> we saw earlier Augustine's view that consequent to the fall of the angels, the remaining angels stayed in eternal happiness with God. They remained with the Lord in loyal obedience and also received a sure knowledge to make them secure concerning their own everlasting stability from which they were never to fall. And if Augustine thinks it, everyone else thinks it too. <laughs> <clears throat> While this view proved dominant in early and medieval theology, with few exceptions, that's a footnote that I won't read, um, some Protestant theologians departed from this view, tying the confirmation of the angels to the atoning work of Christ. Calvin offers one of the boldest accounts of Christ's confirmation of the angels. Of Colossians 1.20, he writes, all right, if you think Calvin is boring, he's like one of those old standard theologians, you just got to read him because he is very creative. <clears throat> it was, however, necessary that the angels also should be made to be at peace with God. For being creatures, they were not beyond the risk of falling, had they not been confirmed by the grace of Christ. Farther, in that very obedience which they render to God, there is not such absolute perfection as to give satisfaction to God in every respect and without need of pardon. And this beyond all doubt is what is meant by the statement in Job 4.18, he will find iniquity in his angels. Beyond all doubt. <coughs> <laughs> we must therefore conclude that there is not on the part of angels so much of righteousness as would suffice for their being fully joined with God. They have therefore need of a peacemaker, through whose grace they may wholly cleave to God. Now Calvin's suggestion that angels might have some need of pardon for iniquity strikes an odd note, um, but the claim that as creatures they were at risk of falling and accordingly experienced fear and insecurity is perhaps one that we could more readily embrace. Edwards in Miscellany 935, or his Pensees, writes, the angels, till they were confirmed at Christ's ascension, served God more from a spirit of fear being yet in probation and their eternal happiness or eternal damnation of being yet suspended on their perfect obedience and not yet completed, their service was more mercenary. But when Christ ascended and they were confirmed, thenceforward their service became more disinterested and merely the service of love, being sure of eternal life by the infallible promise of God. <clears throat> While attributing fear, insecurity, and a mercenary disposition to the angels might seem to be a bit of a stretch, it may perhaps be defended as the counterpart to the eagerness with which angels inquire into these things on the one hand. So first Peter, they're really eager to inquire into this stuff, so maybe at the same time, there's this fear and insecurity. <clears throat> and an attempt to honor the way in which the angels are reconciled to God by Christ on the other, referring to Colossians 1. So at least he's working with this stuff. Thomas, um, Thomas Aquinas, provides the groundwork for this possibility. Departing from Bonaventure, there are two more guys we read, in suggesting that beatitude admits of degrees, such that angels were confirmed after the fall, yet continue to progress in beatitude after the fall. Right? So leave it to, me, to a medieval to come up with a cool distinction like that. <clears throat> we find in John Donne a delightful exploration of this theme. How have the angels any reconciliation? Colossians 1, 19 through 20. 
they need a confirmation. For the angels were created in blessedness, but not in perfect blessedness, blessedness ending with an E for all of you Anna Green Gables fans. <laughs> but to the angels that stood, their standing being of grace and their confirmation being not one transient act in God done at once, but a continual succession and emanation of daily grace, belongs to this reconciliation by Christ, because all manner of grace, and where any def deficiency is to be supplied, proceeds from the cross, from the merits of Christ. Yet the angels might fall if this reconciler did not sustain them. So Thomas works with this uh, beatitude that is confirmed and then admits of degrees. Um, Dunn does this cool thing in a sermon of his where they're created in blessedness, but there are degrees of blessedness where they can grow in perfection. And all blessedness, all grace comes from Christ and his cross. <coughs> So the same decisive element is present, namely the angel's need of confirmation, given the possibility that they might fall. But a distinction between blessedness and perfect blessedness replaces the iniquity proposed by Calvin and the fear suggested by Edwards, John Dunn wins. <coughs> While the possibility of angelic iniquity, fear, or lack of perfect blessedness after the fall provides one avenue for exploring this topic, focusing attention more specifically on their response to the mystery of the incarnation provides a second. So one way is to explain um, the state of the angels, fear, insecurity, or whatever. Another way is to look at how they focus on the incarnation. Mm, here we go. In Miscellany 554, Edwards writes that the remedy for the sinful creature was a thing sealed with seven seals, an impenetrable mystery. Delving into the role of this mystery, he writes, it was fit that the angels should be confirmed after they had seen Christ in the flesh. For this was the greatest trial of the angels' obedience that there ever was. If the other angels rebelled only at its being foretold that such, such a one in man's nature should rule over them, how great a trial was it when they saw a poor, obscure, despised, afflicted man, and when they had just seen him so mocked and spit upon and crucified and put to death like a vile malefactor. This was a great trial to those thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, those mighty, glorious, and exalted spirits, whether or no they would submit to such a one for their sovereign Lord and King. Given this ignorance and the ensuing trial of the angels as they witnessed the events of the incarnation, life, and passion of Jesus Christ, it was the fulfillment of God's plan through the resurrection which confirmed the angels through their witness of the unsearchable wisdom of God. As Owen says, by the recapitulation of all things into this one head, the manifold, various, unsearchable wisdom of God was made known unto the angels themselves. They knew not before of the design and work of God after the entrance of sin. These could not comprehend the wisdom that, that might repair that loss, but hereby the manifold wisdom of God, His infinite wisdom and the treasures of it, able by various ways to attain the ends of His glory, was made known to them. <coughs> This is similar to John Newton, who suggests that there, was li there are likewise an innumerable company of elect or good angels who were preserved by sovereign grace and are now established together with believers in Christ Jesus. So there's this notion that they were preserved or in some way confirmed or blessed or whatever, but then that grows through the work of Christ. This line of reflection is not a uniquely Protestant affair. As we have seen, Thomas paved the way for this development, and in the 20th century, Hans Urs von Balthasar, that's a mouthful, but the dude is awesome, um, drew upon Suarez and Sheban to develop a middle ground between the position developed thus far, and Augustine's claim that the unfallen angels were confirmed immediately upon their refusal to rebel. Suarez suggests that the angels originally received grace in anticipation of the grace of Christ. So you're confirmed, but it's only in anticipation of the reality which is to, co which is to come. <clears throat> Sheban, in a similar vein, distinguished between preordination and reestablishment of the angels, arguing for what amounts to a confirmation in two steps. The reestablishment of the angels, which was, accompanied, which was accomplished when the incarnation actually took place, can mean only that their sanctity was now deeply and firmly rooted in the foundation which God had preordained from eternity and was adorned with a crown by which it was to receive its final consecration. In short, whether by distinguishing between preservation and confirmation in Christ, or by His preordination and the confirmation of the unfallen angels, a middle ground exists within Catholic thought between the position of Augustine and that of the Protestant theologians we've been following, grounding the confirmation of the angels in the predestined work of Christ. <clears throat> I was going to riff on that for a second, but I won't. <clears throat> After all, we have nation ball. <clears throat>
<clears throat> Stuart. How, how, <laughs> so how might li this line of thought impact the church? If the angels in heaven are confirmed only through the saving work of Christ, this offers us a powerful reminder to the church that there is no thing in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, which is what it is and becomes what it is meant to be apart from the saving work of Christ. There are no independent powers, no Tom Bombadil, no realities whose existence and purpose is not bound up with the death and resurrection of the one through whom and for whom all things were made. What does it mean to be an angel, a politician, a chemist, for that matter, a mountain or a maple tree? It means being this in, through, and for the risen Lord Jesus Christ. If the angels themselves filling the heavens while permanently employed in the worship of God are dependent upon the risen Lord for their knowledge of God and establishment therein, surely this is the case for those elements of God's creation more distant from the throne of God and more prone to distance and opposition to the will of God. While we can only hint at such a project in this context, it is worth noting the massive commitment to the integration of all things, which includes their confirmation and perfection with and in the person and work of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We're going to skip a bit that roots, that develops that line of thought in terms of the sanctification of the angels, which is fun, but we'll keep moving. <clears throat> okay, fourth point. Christ the head in the order he brings. Our fourth line of inquiry considers the impact of Christ's atonement upon the unfallen angels as he becomes their head, bringing order to the angelic ranks and the whole of creation thereby. The Catholic Catechism, this big cool book that summarizes Christian, Catholic doctrine, states that, the, that Christ is the center of the angelic world. They are His angels, and they belong to Him because they were created through and for Him. That they were created for Christ, open, that they were created for Christ, opens the interesting possibility of a telos yet to be fulfilled. The idea that Christ has not always been the center of their world in the same way. Calvin inquires, but who might reach fallen man? One of the angels? They also had need of a head, through whose bond they might cleave firmly and undividedly to their God. Edwards adds in one of his miscellanies, For God, having from eternity, from his infinite goodness, designed to communicate himself to creatures, the way in which he designed to communicate himself to elect beloved creatures, all of them, was to unite himself to a created nature and to become one of the creatures, and to gather together in one all elect creatures in that creature that he assumed into personal union with himself. In short, while in some sense Jesus has always been the head of the angels, for they were created through and for him, it seems to be the case that they, the way in which the triune God elected himself to be the head of the angels was as the incarnate Son, <coughs> Jesus Christ. And therefore the angels awaited their rightful head from the time of their creation until the incarnation, passion, and ascension of Christ. Right? They've, been, they've been sitting around waiting for their rightful king to come, and now through Christ's ascension after the atoning work, everything is made right because they now really have their head. But what changed for the angels upon the installation of Jesus Christ as their head? How are they affected by the reconciliation of all things in Christ? Thomas touches on this reconciliation in his commentary on Colossians, but does not develop it beyond the idea that we are reconciled and all things are set at peace, whether on earth, that is, Jews and Gentiles, or in heaven, that is, angels and God. And so when Christ was born, the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men. He doesn't do much more than that. Bonhoeffer suggests that the angels are re-employed. For Christ unlocks again the door of paradise today. The angels guard the gate no more. To God our thanks we pray. So they're re-employed, whereas they were guarding the gate to the, um, back to paradise. That job is done, and so it, with Christ coming as their head, they're reordered and they have new tasks. <clears throat> The occupation of the angels was not only to guard the gate of the garden, but to be stewards of the earth. Irenaeus writes, Also in this domain of the earth, in their tasks, were the servants of that God who fashioned everything. And the steward who was placed over his fellow servants kept this domain. The servants were angels, and the steward was an archangel. Their role was at least partly political. The ancient notion of the angel, angels of the nations that you see in Deuteronomy and Daniel and everything, that these nations have angels suggests that they were regarded as the guardians of social order and played a political role. Along these lines, Karl Barth notes, woo I li um, Karl Barth is awesome. <coughs> Karl Barth notes that when, what seems to be meant here in Ephesians and Colossians is that in Christ, the angelic powers are called to order. 
so far as they need it, and they are restored to their original order. All right? The politics in creation and heaven alike are brought to order through the, the installation of this head. So the angels are involved in the political or social order, and the work of Christ restores justice at this level of reality. In being crowned king and putting his kingdom into order, Jesus brought order to the angelic realm as well. While the, angels were, um, while the angels need not be justified for their sin, they needed the benefits of justification in the sense of restoration of cosmic justice and order. <clears throat> we're reminded thereby that atonement reaches far beyond the sphere of our immediate needs, concerns, and sins, including social and political spheres as well. While the relationship between these is complex, we do ourselves a massive disservice in thinking of Christ's work individualistically or even merely in terms of its impact on humankind alone. The work of Christ, after all, is a matter of a kingdom, or more broadly still, the cosmos, the whole of creation. We disregard the political and social aspects of Christ's atonement only to our great detriment, for we serve the Lord of heaven and earth who is putting all things to rights. <clears throat> all right, and now for a shout out to Milton, justifying the ways of God to the angels. We conclude with a final point regarding Christ's atonement and the angels, God's self-justification before them. I saw that. <clears throat> At the beginning of Paradise Lost, you should all read it, <laughs> John Milton invokes the heavenly muse as follows. What in me is dark, illumine what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. But after the fall of Adam and Eve, when, the, when God foretells the defeat of Satan through the incarnation of the Son, with the ensuing sanctification uh, of heaven and earth, the angels rejoice, just are thy ways, righteous are thy, decre thy decrees on all thy works, who can extenuate thee? That was the angels saying that. <clears throat> Milton's justification of the ways of God extends to the angels, for they share our questions and likewise long to understand. Considering this vantage point from a strictly theological standpoint, our God is a God who desires to be known and worshipped by both angels and humankind and therefore to justify his ways to them. Paul clearly affirms God's self-imposed need or commitment to justify himself. Uh, Romans 3, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine for forbearance he had passed over former sins. He has committed to go back and justify himself and to demonstrate his righteousness. <clears throat> God's desire to promulgate his self-justification, it would seem, extends beyond humankind to the angels. For God sought through the church to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, Ephesians 3. Right? <clears throat> Though similar to our second and third points, this final trajectory moves in a fundamentally different direction. So while the angels were the focus in the previous points, God is the focus in this final point, in that the atonement satisfies God's desire or self-imposed obligation to justify his ways to his angels along with the rest of creation. We often ground the necessity of the atonement in the sinful human condition, but this is only one way of construing the necessity of Christ's death and resurrection. Athanasius, for example, adopts an altogether different approach. <clears throat> Best book on the atonement in the history of the church, Athanasius on the Incarnation. Ad <laughs> added benefit. It's really short. <laughs> <laughs> so Athanasius writes, What then was God, being good, to do? Was he to let corruption and death have their way with them? Such indifference to the ruin of his own work before his very eyes would, not argue, would argue not goodness in God, but limitation. It was impossible, therefore, that God should leave man to be carried off by corruption because it would be unfitting and unworthy of himself. In short, Athanasius lays the necessity of the atonement at God's feet. The problem is God's, not ours primarily, even though it includes our problem. Tying this in <clears throat> with our emphasis upon the angels and God's creative purpose that they might know and worship him, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was necessary that God might justify his ways to his heavenly hosts, for it was impossible that God should leave his angels to be left ignorant of his character, and thereby unable to fulfill their calling to worship, because it would be unfitting and unworthy of himself as their creator. How does this line of thought benefit the church? It reminds us that the atoning work of Christ, while for us and for our salvation, is also effective for the angels in a number of ways, but is just as important for God himself. 
It does this by exploring the depth of God's self-involvement in the creative enterprise, such that something was at stake for God himself in the atonement of Jesus Christ. The triune God created the heavens and earth with purpose, <clears throat> and by so doing, fully vested himself in that enterprise to bring this, this purpose to fulfillment. In other words, God bound himself. He bound his identity to these purposes and their fulfillment. Reflecting on the relation between the atonement and angels in this way guides us deeper into, a self -giving, into the self-giving and self-involving God at the heart of the gospel. All right, concluding reflection on the implications of the above thesis. <clears throat> Pascal warns us that man must not think he is on a level with either beasts or angels, and he must not be ignorant of those levels, but should know both. Why? Amy Pa suggests that thinking about angels helps us to resist the confines of our usual theological constructions of the relation between God and his creatures. So if we get, we get stuck in ruts, if all you think about is you and God, you end up following certain patterns of thought which are harmful and leaving lots of other things out. What happens when you think about the angels? It throws in this odd third character which disrupts all the other things and busts you out of those patterns. <clears throat> How does reflecting on the relation between Christ's atoning death and the angels help us resist our usual theological constructions of the atonement? In the course of this article, we have come across several answers. First, reflection on the repopulation of the heavenly city powerfully brings to mind the purpose of the triune God to extend to the creaturely realm the unity and fellowship proper to the life of God. The atonement, in other words, is fundamentally about God sharing his divine life with the creature which demands that we think about unity and fellowship in a profoundly gospel-centered way. <clears throat> Second, one of the primary vocations of the angels reminds us that the purpose of this sharing is worship. We as the church should be a people who long to worship the triune God in ever new ways, a worship grounded in the, in the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the character formation it entails. And I guarantee you that after hearing this lecture, you will start hearing the role of angels in the worship in your churches and in chapel, and you'll start seeing it more and more. You'll also start seeing it in the history of art. You'll notice angels contemplating the cross, weeping at the cross, doing different things. You'll just start seeing angels more, <clears throat> which is cool. <clears throat> I didn't mean you'll start like seeing angels doing it. <laughs> I am refraining from telling stories right now. <laughs> Third, just as our worship is grounded in this event, so is the knowledge which is at its basis. For if the unfallen angels themselves receive their fullest knowledge of God, their highest state of perfection through witnessing the passion of Jesus, then we who are corrupted by sin must surely use this as the center and foundation of our knowledge as well. Fourth, the atonement extends far beyond God's concern with our personal sins. Yeah, your, your sin matters. And so it surely includes this, but reflection upon the angels reminds us that the atonement is a cosmic event, reaching from the most trivial sin to the order and justice of the angelic realms and everything in between. And because in the Bible these angelic realms are bound up with our own political spheres, we are reminded that the atonement has an irreducibly political element. <clears throat> Finally, delving into the intersection of angelology and soteriology brings to our attention the way in which God's own identity is at stake as the one who created and covenanted with his creation, binding himself unconditionally to the fruition of his creature, or his creative purposes in Jesus Christ. There are more things than are dreamt of in our theologies. The purpose of this essay is to suggest some of the ways that this might be the case, reflecting on the, on the impact of the death and resurrection of Christ on the unfallen angels. And as if it were not enough that reflecting on angels feeds the feeling of wonder, fascination, and curiosity, we have found a number of ways that the kingdom, and more specifically the saving work of Christ, which stands at its center, is in fact a question of angels and devils, thrones and principalities, and not only of God and the soul, the soul and this God, as Harnack would have us believe. All right, the end. <clears throat> I've given my first Tory lecture as a full-time faculty member. <laughs> All right, back in the day, we would ask questions of the speakers. So I'm game, although some of you are eager to uh, move on to the evening's activities. So if you want to ask some questions, I'm fair game. What, what I just gave to you 
was not exactly a sort of a standard uh, lecture providing the context for one of the figures. I was doing doctrinal, lo locating it doctrinally, which means I just inundated you in the history of doctrine, and it's based on tons of poking around trying to find what these guys thought about the topic. I came across it by no lo noticing this random little treatment of Jonathan Edwards on the angels and the atonement, and I thought, that's cool. Hmm. And then I noticed something else like it, and then something else, and then I started keeping it all in a file until I had like 14 pages of notes, and I thought, well, there's an article. <coughs> so here you go, all right? So um, if you feel um, inundated in the history of doctrine, there are worse things to do on a Thursday night. And uh, that, was what that was what was going on, all right? Did yeah. you write this um, essay specifically for this lecture, or did you just write it for kicks, or did you write it for something else? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wrote it this week. <laughs> um, no, I've been working on this for some time. It's um, I'll send it off to publishers for in, in an article, uh, so I'll try to publish it as a journal article. And then it, it, it's part of a larger project of exploring the ways in which the atonement affect the cosmos as a whole. Um, so angels at the top, demons at the bottom, us in between, but then what does it mean for the atonement to affect um, the animals, an animal creation? or just physical creation, I mean, um, so mountains and trees. I mean, the Bible talks about weird things along these lines, and the work of Christ touches on all of these. Most of the emphasis is on us, but there's a lot on angels, demons, animals, and creation itself, so that, that forms part of a project of exploring how the atonement shapes the whole cosmos. And I'll see if I can present that chapter of a book later on this semester, we'll see. <clears throat> so, you said that um, like the ancients were the ones nerding out about angelology, mm -hmm. right? They were the ones in all of this stuff yep. and, and describing it and incorporating it into their theologies. But they also um, had this belief, um, if I heard correctly, that um, you know the angels already kind of like knew everything. They were they were much more all knowing, much more like omniscient mm -hmm. than um, modern theologians do today. But this this more recent, um, you know, doctrine of, of angels and what they know, this idea that they um, kind of are impacted by and, um, and uh, like, influenced by and, and take part in what's, what God's doing, like, just as we are, mm -hmm. like, in a, in a more active sense, like yeah. a partial knowledge kind of sense, seems a whole lot more interesting. Yep. So why is it that angelology is so neglected <clears throat> in today's day and age, even though thought on that matter has shifted? Because mm -hmm. it seems like it's become more interesting, not less. Yeah, to be... Um, <laughs> more recently, I mean, if the 1500s is more recently... I mean, so a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of, the, a lot of the stuff that was the most fun was Calvin, Edwards, Owens. Like, those guys had quite a bit of reflection. That was quite a while ago. All right, so the medievals had the notion that the angels learn and grow a little bit, but they are way more hesitant to develop it and have fun with it. So it's a matter of emphasis. And, and then probably the heyday for this reflection was Owen and, and, uh, and Edwards, which is quite some time ago. So uh, unfortunately, I guess we don't think angels are worth spending that much time on. Although in popular literature, there's lots of stuff about angels. Um, you know, kids dying and going and seeing angels and then coming back to life and writing books about it. Yeah. So, don't know. Yeah. I'm glad to answer more questions. I'm also glad to go home. It's been a nice long day. <laughs> I don't have all of Isaiah memorized yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know tutors are supposed to be all knowing. Uh, <laughs> what does Isaiah 11 talk about? Isaiah 11 talks about how the, um, he kind of has this reconstitution of creation. Okay. Tori student with a Bible. <laughs> Whoa. Um, and so he's talking about, we'll show both the lamb and the leopard, Charlie, down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion will 
Okay. That kind of prophetic literature um, that talks about the restoration of creation mm -hmm. has all sorts of cool stuff to do with the atonement, yes. Okay. Um, so here's, here's the quick version of it. Um, Christ uh, restores all things to the, to, the, to the fullness of their potential or for God's creative purposes for them according to their capacity. So depending on the kind of thing it is, that affects how it's restored through Christ. Merely physical things are simply resurrected just as Christ's body was resurrected. But other things are, are saved in a more complex manner. And the most complex salvation of all is for us, where according to the medievals, we're at the center of the, creative, of the creaturely and the spiritual realm. So our, our salvation is the most complex. In Christ becoming man, he deals with all things branching out on either side. Which is all sorts of cool stuff, right? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Y'all have a good evening. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.